joy, the spirit of the singing, of the preaching. Uh, this touched my heart. And uh, I love this crowd. And uh, the more it is criticized, the more that I like it. And uh, this is my type. This is my type. I'm glad that God put me in this way. I could have done a whole lot of other things. But in His grace, He kind of hooked me up uh, with you. And I'm grateful for it. A blessed man tonight. And uh, I'm not a big shower, I'm a big crier. I sit in my corner and I just cry. That's what I do. And uh, I'm about crying about it, if you believe. And uh, hopefully I am going to be able to get through this. So many of you have asked about my wallet, and I appreciate your concern. I, I got up early this morning at daylight and retraced the steps, thinking I would find it. And, and that was not to be, so we were able to uh, cancel all the credit cards and and I had a check in there for my checking account, and they said you might want to close that. So we closed the checking account down today as well, and, and I'll get a, uh, the license and that kind of stuff later. Uh, but, um, but, but I do appreciate your concern. Um, I had so many people ask. I, um, I always carry uh, a couple hundred bucks with me in my pocket just in case you never know when you find a good deal or something. And, and so I had some cash in my pocket. And so that's good. I can eat and I can get home. And then so, but, but several of y'all came up to me and asked if, if, if I needed some money. Do you, do you need some money? In fact, Brother Ouellette called me last night and offered uh, uh, some money to get home. And if I had been sharp enough, if I had been quick enough, uh, I could have made a lot of money on this deal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I blew that is what I did. But then Brother Cooper, I got up this morning and I talked about finding a wallet, needed a new suit, credit card, and God blessed him like that. Brother Cooper, I've had probably, I think, six people come up to me and say, I am so glad that you found your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> so what you need to pray now is that he will return the wallet. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was joking, to be honest with you. I'll tell you, Ms. Sharon Godfrey really had a whole lot worse situation than I do. No matter where you're at, you can always find somebody that's got it worse than you do. She found a wallet in a restaurant drive through I think, a lane, saw a wallet, opened the door, picked it up. $1,600 in cash in that wallet. And you're thinking, what's wrong with that? It also had the guy's driver's license. <laughs> now that's bad. That's bad there. Several years ago, we were in Peru on a mission trip. I think we had 21 or 22 teenagers with us. Not a real smart idea, but anyway, we had a bunch of teenagers in Peru. And, and, and some of these teenagers, this was their first time being overseas, and so I, I hammered to them. I preached to them that your passport, it is like gold. It is on a black market. It's worth a lot of money. If you lose your passport, you may not get home. You hold on to your passport. You protect your passport. I, I preached it to them. I mean, before we left, I, oh, I, I, just, I just knew I'm going to have a teenager left in Peru and had been disaster what we do and, and and so the last couple of days we were leaving out of Kipa, coming to Lima and we came to Lima spent the night in the happy hostel. There was nothing happy about that place but that's where we were staying. And, and that morning we got up and we were headed to the airport and, and the airport was across the city of Lima and uh, we hired a bunch of cabs and, and shuttled everybody over there. And we got over to the airport, got everybody out, got all of the bags, got the terminal, get ready to check in. And I could not find my passport. <laughs> I looked everywhere. I blamed my wife, I, 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 but, but I couldn't find it. So we called back to the happy hospital on the other side of Lima. And uh, the proprietor there went up to the room, and sure enough, there was my passport. My wife had forgotten to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do? We don't have time. We don't have time to go back across the city, get the passport, come back. And she said, you don't worry, I, I get it to you. And so she called a taxi cab and gave this taxi cab my passport to drive it to the airport. And I'm praying that she has found the one honest taxi driver in the airport. <laughs> and sure enough, about an hour later, there's a taxi driver pulls up to the airport, gets out and waves a blue passport. I don't know if I've ever tipped a guy a hundred dollar bill before. I did him. I did him. I was so glad to see it. But then all of those morons that were teenagers that were traveling with me. Every five minutes, one of them come up. Preacher, do you have your passport? 
understand that salvation is not in do, salvation is in God. But when you read the book of Galatians, it becomes clear that Paul is not talking about just about being saved, but he is dealing with what happens to a man after you get saved. And the issue in Galatians is not that they believe that you could be saved by something other than grace and faith, but they believe that you can be sanctified by something other than grace and faith. Look at chapter 2, if you would, in verse number 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. I, I don't have any more ways that you can say it than what he said in that verse. We're not justified by the works of the law. So he's very clearly talking about that when we can say we are justified by faith. Look at chapter 3. O foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of the faith? Well, that's a good question. So answer. How did you receive the Holy Spirit? Is it by the works of the law or is it by the hearing of faith? Well, I think that you would agree that it is by the hearing of faith. You got saved by faith. Right. So verse 3. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? To be made perfect is not sinless perfection, but to be mature is to be complete. Are you made perfect by the flesh? Or are you made perfect by the spirit? How, how did you receive the Spirit? You received the Spirit by faith, but not by, law, but by, by, by faith. So, so, so Paul is saying, do you think that you got saved by the Spirit, but now you are sanctified and you're, you're made perfect by the flesh? No. no. That's right. And, and, and what he is saying is that the flesh can't save you and the flesh can't perfect you. That's right. There is a dependence on the Holy Spirit for you to get saved, but there is a dependence on the Holy Spirit for Him to sanctify you as well. And the issue in the book is that the flesh cannot do what the flesh cannot do. That's right. I think it's one of the most misunderstood doctrines for most Christians. I also believe that it's a fundamental key to any victory in your life. Sure. So Paul's going to lay out three good maps. There are three ways to live the Christian, live the Christian life. Two of them are ditches. One is a biblical way. I want to try to define all three if I can. And the first is legalism. Now it's very easy, it's very easy to stick that label on everybody who preaches on separation and standard. That's also lazy to do that. I've been called legalist a few times. I'm sure that you have as well, that's fine. But at least know what it is when you're saying it. Well, verse number three. Are you so foolish having been God of the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? That's the quintessential definition of legalism. It, 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 is, it is a sanctification. It is works by the flesh. Now, now, let me flesh it out. Let me make a couple of statements. Don't die on me, all right? I, 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 I'm going somewhere. But let me just make a couple of statements. And the first statement is this, is that legalism is not standards. Someone has defined it legalist as someone who has more standards than you do. And unfortunately, there are some Christians who believe that. Right. There are some who, in the name of liberty, calls anybody with a standard a legalist. Right. So a realistic Christian, somebody who doesn't go to movies, and doesn't have a TV, doesn't dress like the world, that would be a legalist. By the way, everybody has a dress standard. Everybody does. If you were to come to our church, if you were to come to Victory, our church, and you sat there long enough, you would pick up probably that, that, that ladies have to be dressed a certain way to stand on our platform or to teach a class or whatever it might be. You, you wouldn't see any ladies on our, this is our church, you wouldn't see any ladies on our platform uh, and in a skirt above their knees, of nothing tight or low cut or skimpy or anything like that. In fact, in our church, you do what you want to do more. In our church, you wouldn't see a lady on the platform in pants. And you would gather that there is a standard here. 
Now, I don't care if you agree with the standard, if, if you don't like the standard, or if your standard is ten times higher than mine. I, I don't care. That's, that's beside the point. But there is a standard. Even in contemporary, modern, progressive churches, there is a line there. Now, now you're going to have to look hard to find out where the line is. But there is a line. There is a line that they, they will not cross. So, so, so if standards like, is legalism, then everybody, to some degree, is a legalist. But legalism is not about where you draw the line. Legalism is about your attitude toward that line. I, I know very conservative people who live just as tight as anybody as you will ever meet. And they're not under bondage. And they're not pharisaical. And they're not judgmental. And they don't have a critical spirit. And they love Jesus and they're happy. The standard has not made them legalistic. And it's really lazy to just stick that label on anybody who preaches against standards or separation. And there's nothing original about that. And, and all of us have been called legalists by our carnal cousin. And by now, it has lost its punch. But standards is not legalism. And then I can say to you that legalism is performing spiritual life by the works of the flesh. It is not in having the standards. It is depending on those standards to make you spiritual. It is not that you have a list, but that all of your spirituality is wrapped up in that list. Now, now, now I'm killing the service, I know, because somebody hears that and hears what they think that they heard is that I said you don't need a list. And the reality is you and I probably need a lot longer list than what we have. My flesh stinks, all right? My flesh needs offense. My flesh needs guards. I need a whole lot of boundaries to keep my flesh in check because it is not spiritual yet. So, so don't walk away from here tonight and say that I am opening the door that you don't need a list. No, you do need a list, and you probably need a lot longer list and add two or three things to the list tonight that are not on the list. But there are Christians that labor, they labor to keep their standards, and they come to them, but they're hateful, and, and they're depressed, and they don't have any joy, and there's no victory in their life, and, and you and I look from the outside, and I, boy, I'm impressed with how zealous they are with their list, and how devoted they are to it, but that is not spirituality. There are some Christians who believe that spirituality comes by, 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 by just just trying harder and uh, being miserable and, and, and living by rules that I hate and you can't have any fun. And they have all the essentials and they, and they check all of the boxes except the box that says that the Christian life is lived by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And the more and more that I live this Christian life, the more and more I, I find out that I'm a total failure at it without the power of God in my life. I have found that for me that I can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. I can't witness, I can't pray, I can't preach, I can't have victory. I certainly cannot transform my life. Somebody said, well, just pull yourself up by the bootstraps. That's the dumbest thing that has ever been made in this life. You can't. I don't care the strongest man in this room. You can train for 20 years, but you will never be able to pull yourself up by your bootstrap. And here's what you can do. You can grit your teeth and you can determine, I'm not going to watch that anymore. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to watch it. Or you can submit to the Spirit of Christ. He can change your life. So you don't want to watch those things. Yeah. 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 Trying to crucify the flesh by the flesh. And all of that does is it leads to disillusionment and discouragement and beating yourself up every time that you fail. And, and you can go through the motions and you can keep the list, but there is no power. And here's the problem here's the problem that when you live just by a list, you become proud of the list. And when you become proud of the list, then you become judgmental of anybody that has a list with not the same items as you have on your list. And, and, and when your spirituality is defined entirely by a list of externals, and when you are so proud of how you keep that list, and when you look down on any other Christian who doesn't cross every T exactly like you do, welcome to lead the list. That is what you have become. And what legalism does is legalism focuses on rules and not the relationship. I borrow an illustration. Imagine that a lady gets married to a man, and when they move in together, and after the marriage, it, 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 they, they have the marriage, and she finds out that her husband is very controlling. He is very, very demanding. 
And from day one, he dictates to everything in her life. Everything that she wears, he puts her on a schedule. She can't leave the house. She don't have any money. I mean the household chores. And he is on her every day. He is very demanding and he's very demeaning. He prints out a list. Here's all the things that you have to do. And you've got to have dinner on the table at a certain time. And, and you've got to have all the laundry done. And the house has got to be kept spotless. And she is doing everything on the list. And she is miserable. She's in the marriage. She's in the relationship, and there is no joy in it. There is no relationship there. She is a dutiful wife. You look at her, and you think that she's the perfect wife, but she is very unhappy in her marriage. She is doing everything on the list that is demanded of her, but it is bondage is what it is. And then suppose her husband dies. And she one day meets another man, and they get married. And he doesn't come with a list of demands. He just loves her. And they build this wonderful relationship together. He doesn't really make her do anything. He doesn't browbeat her. He doesn't tell her this is what you have to do in order to keep me happy. And one day she realizes she's doing everything for him that she was doing for the first husband. She's cleaning the house. She's doing laundry. She's had dinner prepared. And she loves doing it. And she doesn't do it because it's on the list. She does it because she fell in love with someone who loved her. And she's doing it not because of a list. She's doing it out of love. And there's Christians tonight, they're miserable and they have no joy in living for Christ. It's because they're so focused on the rules and they don't have a relationship. Hey, Christianity is not loving the world and loving not loving the world. My flesh isn't doing that, and I'm not mad about it. I'm not going there, and I'm just fine. I'm not dealing with those things. I'm not wearing that, and I am not miserable. There's a teenage girl in here tonight that your parents are very strict, and they have very strict dress standards on you, and you chafe at the rules. You abide by the rules. But you cannot wait for the day that you turn 18 where nobody is going to tell you how to dress and you can finally dress how you want. All that you have are rules. And there's a teenage girl in here tonight and you have the same rules and you're just fine with it. You're modest and you're feminine and you're discreet and that's exactly how you want to be. And we are watching our kids grow up in a Christian home and they are running away from standards just as fast as they can because they got rules but they have no relationship. All of the spiritual life is based on the external. Legalism depends on the flesh for sanctification. It is perfection by the needs of the flesh. And I will tell you that the fruit of legalism is corruption because that is all the flesh can produce. Galatians 5 and verse 8, he that sowed to the flesh of the flesh reap corruption. I know that in my flesh, in me that is in my flesh, well, of no good thing. And corruption is not always drunkenness and fornication. Sometimes corruption is pride. Sometimes corruption is self-righteousness. That's the fruit of legalism. However, there's a ditch on both sides. When someone lives in legalism, and please understand, it's not the list. I said nothing tonight to say that you don't need standards. But when a person lives by the list, that is all. He will finally is spare him. And when he does, he will only run over to the other ditch that is called license. From living too strictly by standards to having no standards. Verse number 13. He says in Galatians 5, he says, Brethren, you be called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. That verse describes what's happening in Baptist churches all over America right now. There are preachers tonight who are mocking standards. They are lowering the bar of separation and they're doing it in the name of liberty. No, all of us know, and I'm not shooting at anybody. I have no access to ground. I have nobody to shoot at. But all of us know preachers who browbeat their standards into their people, and the church complies because it is a bully pulpit. But within, there are others who stand, and they incur 
encourage worldliness as a reaction to those bullies. And the most worldly, carnal people in the world claim liberty, but they are using their liberty as a cloak for their sin. Legalism is a dependency on the flesh. License is to indulge the flesh. Do you know how the people can take good words, redefine them, and it becomes a different word? Uh, for example, in, in Jude verse 4, certain men from in awares who were before or, 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 or ordained to condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lascivious. When you turn the grace of God into lascivious, unrestrained sexual desire, it is no longer grace. And people talk about liberty, but it's a ruse to feed their flesh. It is not liberty any longer. By the way, that word grace, Titus, Titus 2 and verse 11, uh, for the grace of God uh, that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. Oh, grace is going to teach us something. Here's what it teaches us. That in I am godliness and rarely love, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. If the grace of God doesn't teach you that, it's not viable grace. And the contemporary church has redefined grace as permission to do whatever you want to do. That's not grace. Grace is the power to do what Christ wants me to do. And if your definition of grace does not come to Titus 2 verse number 11, then it's not viable grace because grace, grace, and that's the favorite word. Grace teaches you to, to not be wary. It is to have no desires for this world. If grace in your life is a newfound freedom to throw off the shackles of standards and holiness, grace, that, that's not viable grace. So many of you think that to live like that, you think that you are in liberty. Yeah. And the rules on what I watch, and the rules where I go, and right. the rules on how I dress, and there are no rules, and I, I am free in Christ. And if somebody was to warn you, you would just scream, legalist. That's all that you have. Yeah. Well, you're just, you're just a legalist. And it's amazing to me, it's amazing to me that, that we can so violate our conscience. We have people sitting in our churches and they sit down and they watch something on TV. That, that we can literally, we can literally watch something where they literally take, take the Lord's name in vain. Take the Lord's name in vain and it is entertainment to us. And then get up on Sunday and sing, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And there was no power in your life when Hollywood is more real to you than Jesus Christ. Yeah. I'm killing the service, I know, so I might as well get In our independent Baptist movement, there was a time when we leaned toward legalism. We had the standards and we were proud of the standards. There were times, buddy, we preached, every time we preached, it was blood and guts and we cracked the whip. And a lot of Christians learned to live like robots, just <laughs> marching to the preacher's demand. And there's been a lot of problems in our movement. One of the biggest has been flesh dependency. We, we became successful. And the entire emphasis became on what I'm doing and doing even more. It's not a problem now. There are very few churches in our circle that have strict standards and demand that every member keep all those standards. The problem is not legalism. The problem today is life. The problem is not checking off the list. The problem is that the list has been thrown out the window. And legalism will always lead you to ISIS unless you can get to Jesus. And how many of our children, and my heart breaks tonight, but how many of our children have grown up with every standard that was right and godly, and as soon as they could, they read over to license because they had standards, and they were so proud of how spiritual that they were, but they never learned true freedom in Jesus Christ. Conservative church and they run through the contemporary church in droves. But I want you to know tonight that corruption to the flesh, corruption might be that now you are free to drink a little wine with your meal and you can flaunt your flesh down the street and, and you have freedom in Christ and you can now go to the movies. Or the corruption could be that you are a self righteous, judgmental, critical Pharisee that thinks you're more spiritual than everybody else. It is still corruption. Some of it stinks on the outside and some of it stinks on the inside. Neither one of it produces any joy. Neither one of it produces any real victory. Neither one of them is the Christ life. And, and so many millennials didn't find any joy. Joy, and they didn't find any victory of legalism. They ran over to license and they won't fight it in that ditch either. Yeah. Neither one of them is the spirit led walk of God. Neither one of them is the dependency on the Holy Spirit. Neither one of them is the Christ. Yeah. There's a ditch of legalism 
I have my list, I'm proud of my list, and you better keep all of my list. There's a license, nobody tells me how to live. Uh, yeah. But Paul said in Galatians 5 and verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty of yeah. Christ has made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Liberty is not the freedom to go wild. Liberty is a dependence on the Spirit of God for the power of Christ to live as He has called us to live. It is not the permission to be carnal. It is the power to be holy. Liberty doesn't mean that I can go sin because of grace. Liberty means I am free to not sin because of grace. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace by now? God forbid. You see, by now, you and I should know that our flesh is wicked and it is full of corruption. My flesh did not get saved. And my flesh right now is not on its way to sanctification. My flesh is no more sanctified today than it was 40 some years ago when I got saved. And here's what I have learned. I have learned that I cannot depend on the flesh. And if I indulge the flesh, it will always lead me to indulge in carnal lust. So here's the only thing that I can do with the flesh is is crucified. Yeah. It is to die to it. If I want to live the Christ life, if I want to walk in victory, if I want to have any power in my life, then I have to die to that stinking flesh every day. Galatians 2 and verse 20. Look at it. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to read Galatians 2 20. I am crucified with Christ. Crucified is a passive voice. It's not that you crucified yourself and you got saved. You were crucified with Christ. We'll look at chapter 5 and verse 24. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. That's active voice. It is something that you do now that you are saved. The key to liberty is not indulgence of the flesh. It is certainly not a dependency on the flesh. It is crucifying the flesh by the power of Christ in you. And again, how often you do that? Every day. Multiple times a day. And self-crucifixion is a foreign concept to most Christians. We sing songs about it. We don't even know what we're singing. Whatever he leads, I'll go. There's probably going to be some flesh crucifixion in that. I surrender all. Not if your flesh had anything to do with it. But when you and I, by the strength of Christ and the indwelling spirit, Yield the members of our body to righteousness and a spirit of submission. There you and I will find liberty. My wife is a very godly lady. If you've not met her, I wish that you could. My wife is a most spiritual person that I know. I met her when she was a teenager. My dad was pastor in the hills of West Virginia. Her family... I went to an American Baptist church and some troubles in that church. They came over to the church that dad pastored and became independent Baptist. And that's where I met her as a teenager. We got married this year, July the 3rd. We've been married 30 years. 30 years. I love my wife. My wife, um, I grew up in a preacher's home, had all the standards that you can imagine. And my wife grew up in a Christian home, but they didn't have the same standards, especially in the area of dress that we had. But when my wife was a teenager, I don't know, 14 or 15, and I, and please understand, this is not the point of my message. But when my wife was a teenager, 14 or 15, God began to convict her heart about wearing pants. And she decided that she couldn't wear them any longer. That wasn't a standard in their home. She wasn't under pressure. Nobody was telling her to. It wasn't because everybody else had changed. It's just the Holy Spirit convicted her. And she surrendered that to Christ. I've been married to my wife for 30 years. For 30 years, I've never seen my wife in a pair of pants. But here's the thing about it. I've never told her this is a rule of life. I've never told her, you married a preacher, you can't, you can't work. I've never said, now, now this, is the, this is the standard, this is the list. In fact, I don't know if anybody has ever told her that. She surrendered that to Christ. She died to self in that area. 
She allowed the Holy Spirit to dictate to what she wears and how she dresses. And here's the funny thing about it. I've never seen her mad about it. She's not upset. She's not miserable. She doesn't look at how everybody else dresses and wish I hadn't done that. No. She's actually happy about it. No, no, don't, don't let it die. Some of you may, may have never heard that the woman shouldn't wear pants. And stuff. That's, that's not what I don't care what your standard is. But there are some girls tonight that you grew up in home with a rule like that. You go to a Christian school where nobody has that rule. You become proud and you think that you're more spiritual than they are. Because you have a rule that you live by, but you hate the rule. And one day you turn 18, go off to college, move out of the house. First thing you do is put on a pair of blue jeans. You kept the rule. But that rule didn't do a thing for your spirituality. Yes, sir. And when you are finally free, when you finally have liberty, you run all the way over to license because nobody's going to tell me how to dress. I have liberty. You don't have liberty. You're in just as much bondage to the flesh as you were in yeah. the and every saint of God in here knows that there was a time when God said to said no to something in your life. And it may have been cigarettes, it might have been movies, it might have been rock albums. They used to have youth meetings where they'd build, build bonfires and they'd come and they'd throw their records and their cassette tapes and all of that in there. And you remember when you threw certain clothing items, certain albums, and, and you remember when you threw that in the garbage and you didn't do it because you were pressured to. You didn't do it because you were forced to conform to a rule. No, you accepted that rule into your life because Christ demanded it. And that decision didn't ruin you. It actually delivered you as well. Yes. There are some Christians tonight who do not listen to rock music and it is killing them. And there are other Christians tonight that do listen to rock music because they have liberty and it is killing them. And there are other Christians tonight who don't listen to rock music because they crucified that thing years ago and they have no desire and they are living. And I look at all of these young people tonight and this is where my heart is. There's enough young people in this room tonight to literally win the world. Yes. Yes. To not go to in the ditch. And the temptation for you is, is to not force more standards and be more rigidly miserable. But yet I've got to list. No, the temptation for you is to redefine liberty and use it as a cloak for the indulgence of the flesh. But I say to you tonight that if you want victory in your life, and if you want joy in your Christianity, and if you want intimacy in your walk with God, you must crucify the flesh. It is not a miserable thing. It is a joyful thing as well. Amen. 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 And I'm going to get it by license. But there is a life that is abundant. And it is overflowing. And it is joyful. And it is victorious. And it is powerful. It's found in the power of the Holy Spirit. I borrow an illustration tonight and I'm done. I borrow the illustration from another preacher. I suppose tonight that we bring into this auditorium a portable basketball goal, standard height 10 feet. We take a boy, a four or five year old boy, just big enough to walk, and we bring him to the platform, we give him a basketball. Here's the challenge, son. I want you to dunk that 10 foot goal. We cheer him on, pump him up, give him confidence. The boy takes the basketball and he jumps his eyes again. Obviously, he's not going to be able to dunk that basketball. We cheer him on more, maybe we berate him. Preach to him, encourage him, whatever it might be. And he tries, and he tries, and he tries. But there will eventually come a point where he will realize what a failure that he is. And he will quit. Right. That is legalism. But you know, 10 foot is so legalistic. It's so unloving. There's no grace in that. So let's help him. So we take the basketball goal and let's lower it to three feet. Now we give him the basketball. Now he takes the basketball and he dribbles and he very easily goes up. He doesn't even have to jump and he slams the ball for the day. And we all cheer him on. We congratulate him. How, 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 what, what a wonderful thing that he's done. He hasn't done anything. All we have done is just lower the standard. There's no accomplishment in dunking a three foot reel. Anybody can do that. That is license. It is indulging the flesh and we are calling it victory and it is not victory. You can't meet the standard. The standard is too high. 
But you can't lower the standard or else it's not the standard. That's right. So we look out and we find a man in our auditorium that's seven feet six inches. Strapping strong. Bringing to the platform. His head touches the rim just about. We take the little boy. We place him on his shoulder. And now on his shoulder he is eye level with the rim. And now by the power of someone that is, that is higher than him. He is able to meet the standard and do what is expected of him. I say to you tonight that that is liberty to live the Christ life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And some of you tonight are living the same. You're squeaky clean. You got a long list. That is your definition of spirituality. Yeah. And you're proud of your rules. And you're judgmental of others. And for all of your rules. You don't really have a spiritual heart. You don't have any joy. No compassion for others. No peace. And everything about your Christianity is on the outside. And you will one day despair of those right. rules. Yeah. And you'll run to the other side. And what you ought to do tonight is you ought to come to an altar and say, Lord, I confess my pride, my self-dependency. I am failing at producing any fruit of the Spirit. And forgive me tonight for the corruption that I cannot see, but I know is in my heart. And I'm not asking you to come and get my list and make it your standard. No, I'm asking you, wouldn't you rather let the Spirit of God speak to you? That there is a life of victory where the Spirit of God can convict you. And out of your love for Christ, and because you believe that it would be easy to heal, you will have him to dictate in every area of your life. Some of you tonight, your license. You're not as far as you want to be, but you're headed that way. Because in your heart, you're carnal and you're rarely minded. You want that world and you think that liberty is your way to get it. There's nothing new about it. They call them liberty in Acts chapter 6. You've never crucified the flesh. You've never died to say, but it. it's going to wreak corruption. Right. You've got to come to an altar tonight and say, Lord, I confess my worldly desires and my, my lust. And I know the things that I'm indulging the flesh that are not a Christ. My problem tonight is not pride. My problem is a wicked heart. And the Holy Spirit will identify things that you probably need to put on your list. And when he does, you'll think that you will die. But that is when you will finally begin to live. Heavenly Father, tonight, I want to know the power of God. I want to be a spiritual Christian. I want to live the Christ life tonight. I pray tonight for the young people in this room, the pulls, the pressures, and the things that they're reading here. It's a lie. The one thing they're going to discover that that bitch doesn't break any better than this bitch. I want you to encourage their hearts tonight to know that there is an abundant life, that there is a victorious life. There is a life that is pleasing to you. That you can live the Christ life. That you can have victory. That you can have a joy tonight. Our heads are about our eyes and clothes to the cup. The graphics take in the service of 30 seconds. Maybe tonight there's somebody here. God's put his finger on something very specific. It's one thing to come and pray a general prayer for the altar. It's another thing to come and pray something specific. Maybe tonight, the Holy Ghost sat down beside of you and said, I'm talking to you about this. This. And would you come tonight and would you lay that on the altar? Lord, tonight I am dying to this. Don't end up in the ditches. Let the Spirit of God transform you. Walk in liberty, wherewith Christ 